this to me is like the really fascinating material. We don't know what the answer is, but we're looking for patterns. I think we're looking at kind of a type of cosmic alchemy. Still, a lot of people don't know that this technology actually exists. The possibilities here are pretty mind We can't just believe that it was the work of these lone, troubled individuals. And then, like a conspiracy theorist would look at that and say, well, they, the, the Illuminati or somebody planned this way. Now we have to pay up for that by design. discredit this idea. But it's one thing to read about these things, but I think they actually need us to go to some of these places. There could be a whole host of cosmic things that, that our ancestors I know what podcasting is. It's like when you, uh, those dudes who, like, like you turn your iPhone on you and you make like a video in a car, like talk about Obama and Hillary. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> you kind of sit there back there in the back of your car and you talk about Hillary and you like, Trump's a dumbass if he's going to keep Hillary from, he better be start arresting people because we're going to go and we're going to start arresting people if Trump don't start arresting people. we we got to take that in shit in our own hands. <laughs> Son, that's what we're going to have to do. Well, that's like podcasting. That's kind of like podcasting. That's, that's, you know, you could be a YouTuber, turn your... Turn your your phone on for about thirty minutes on your lunch break, and rant in the in the middle of the car. And this guy right here, he does he takes notes. He actually plans things. I was telling him, yeah, we might talk about this, and he's like, oh, okay, I actually got some notes. And I'm I'm a lazy bastard. So I don't write shit. Man, I'm just not good at freestyling like that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just really good at freestyling. Top of the dome. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever we're ready to get started, we can start casting. I think we done started casting about 10 minutes ago, Adam. Did we start casting? See, that's the thing about casting. Sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes you just got to turn the phone on (laughs) and put, you know, you might be able to get one of those little stands and put it on your dashboard and you got your uh your maga hat on and you got your beard your really glorious beard i'm working on it i'm yeah, working on it. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get there pretty soon uh, i'm gonna have uh my that's the post alt-right beard yeah yeah your, your duck dynasty fan club beard okay you know and you can talk about you can talk about obama hillary clinton you know q chemtrails everything that you want to talk about we've actually been kind of thinking about doing that me and Serfiel, like uh doing a fake uh, youtube video <laughs> yeah yeah but you won't know it's us because we're gonna we're gonna disguise ourselves i was thinking maybe i could be in the back seat you know <laughs> you just in the back going yeah preach brother <laughs> yeah yeah you'll just see me back there yeah that's uh we just been making fun of that the last week <laughs> too Look, I'm in a car and friggin' pissed off, okay? All these snowflakes, man. You see me? I'm in a car. I'm looking out the window. Yeah. Well, you know, I was um, I was actually listening to Gusley talk the other day, and they had a guest on, and this lady she she does it. She does a podcast, and she was talking to Scott L about whether people that are on youtube actually whether that's considered a podcast or not and i would actually in all seriousness seriousness say no that that's not a podcast that's more of a video blog or whatever like vlog or you know just a youtuber kind of thing although you know kind of in a way i mean i guess it's kind of you could 
I mean, if you were tech savvy and you could just like isolate the audio, you could put it up as a podcast if you really, really wanted to. Well, then most of them like start as podcasts in there. Mm -hmm. They're kind of just videotaping the podcast. Yeah. See, we were trying that for a, for a little while. Yeah. We were I trying to do we that. We were, try, we were trying to stream. We had some unreliable stuff at Rob's, but I think he's got his stuff better now. The internet, where he doesn't, internet connection? Well, he's, I mean, he's been using the Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi has been more reliable for him than yeah, the, the actual, going out there. all the lines and shit. So that, that's been fine. And so I think we could really do it. I mean, we could do it here. The only thing is we use your camera as an interface. Yeah, we'd have to so use So we got to use, we got to get the Zoom or we got to. We're we going to be making something else. I mean, that's one thing for this year. I want to, you know, make a lot of technical upgrades. So, mm -hmm. I think by the end of the year, you know, there might be a lot of, a lot of new stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's coming along. We get the vocoder. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so we can interview aliens and the devil. Don't don't tell them. Uh, oh, oh, Damn. was I supposed to keep that a secret? Yeah, man, it's oh. real. Oh, well, that's not going to happen. So there is no vocoder. Uh, we lied about that. So we do need a theremin, though. So guys, uh, uh, why don't you chip in on that Patreon? Yeah. Well, can't you make your own? Can, isn't there like a kit that you can make a theremin with? Yeah, I'm sure, man. But you know, I don't want to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> that's too much work i want the but what about man. your buddy doesn't he have a theremin with his like ken doesn't have a theremin no he doesn't have a theremin no he just huh. got like who knows how much money worth the modular crap okay yeah like it's it's crazy because he leaves that thing on like all day right like all day all night it just sits there and just makes noise like months yeah how does that shit work like what's the uh is it just picking up just like background noise and then just no, interpreting I mean, it's it just or something? Basically or? Think of all these as like individual, um, you know, instruments that sounds come into. So you start with whatever source sound you want to use. Yeah. You know, each of those can generate, most of them can generate their own source sounds. And then you just go into the next thing and the next thing. And a lot of these are creating loops and sequences that are being fed back into different parts. And so it just ends up being something that's like constantly moving. And most of that is like analog circuitry too. So it's cool because you're introducing the actual kind of like quantum mechanics into it almost. So oh. it's, not, it's not some perfect thing that can't be influenced by the environment. So oh, there might okay. be some divinatory possibilities with oh actions, see yeah. we need to hook that up with yeah, yeah. joe's yeah i know i talked i talked to him about it yeah like i mean like a freak out yeah that might open a portal to another dimension we might have our own yeah skinwalker ranch in the middle of inglewood yeah uh, it already is man well yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to some of that i think um okay well this is a romper room episode and we're actually going to put this episode out after episode 250. So when you are hearing this, it's about, I think, a couple or two or three weeks later. But we just got some things that we kind of want to talk about that we haven't really been able to talk about because we have guests on the show. And these are just some things that are on our mind. Just a, a mixture of kind of like the conspiracy or political or even paranormal even kind of more paranormal stuff that we kind of talk about we've done this before i think this is like number five cool of the romper room thing and i, I kind of want to turn this into a more um more regular thing maybe like once a month and once every two months or something like that but there was something that you and i looked at at the very beginning of january that i kind of want to play and we're going to talk about this um do you want to set this up or you want me to what this is um, you found this yeah you can you can start it okay well this is a clip from tucker carlson on fox news now before everybody goes nuts and thinks that we've completely embraced the conservative uh world of fox news we haven't um we're pretty apolitical but there's some interesting things going on in this 
clip that we're going to play. And I'm going to play a few minutes of this. And then I'm going to play another clip. Well, we're going to discuss it, and then I'm going to play another clip from somebody else. But there's a common theme here, and I hope that uh, you guys can, can get this. So here is Tucker Carlson from Leaders Show No Obligation to American Voters. This is from January 2nd of this year. So here we go. Matter, But they're less relevant than we think. At some point, Donald Trump will be gone. The rest of us will be gone, too. The country will remain. What kind of country will it be then? How do we want our grandchildren to live? Those are the only questions that matter. The answer to them used to be obvious. The overriding goal for America is more prosperity, meaning cheaper consumer goods. But is that still true? Does anyone still believe that cheaper iPhones or more Amazon deliveries of plastic garbage from China are going to make us happy? They haven't so far. A lot of Americans are drowning in stuff, and yet drug addiction and suicide are depopulating large parts of the country. Anyone who thinks the health of a nation can be summed up in GDP is an idiot. The goal for America is both simpler and more elusive than mere prosperity. It's happiness. There are a lot of ingredients in being happy. Dignity, purpose, self-control, independence, above all, deep relationships with other people. Those are the things that you want for your children. They're what our leaders should want for us and would want if they cared. But our leaders don't care. We are ruled by mercenaries who feel no long-term obligation to the people they rule. They're day traders, substitute teachers. They're just passing through. They have no skin in this game, and it shows. They can't solve our problems. They don't even bother to understand our problems. One of the biggest lies our leaders tell us is that you can separate economics from everything else that matters. Economics is a topic for public debate. Family and faith and culture, meanwhile, those are personal matters. Both parties believe this. Members of our educated upper middle classes, now the backbone of the Democratic Party, usually describe themselves as fiscally responsible and socially moderate. In other words, functionally libertarian. They don't care how you live as long as the bills are paid and the markets function. Somehow they don't see a connection between people's personal lives and the health of our economy, or for that matter, the country's ability to pay its bills. As far as they're concerned, these are two totally separate categories. Social conservatives, meanwhile, come to the debate from the opposite perspective and yet reach a strikingly similar conclusion. The real problem, you'll hear them say, is that the American family is collapsing. Nothing can be fixed before we fix that. Yet like the libertarians they claim to oppose, many social conservatives also consider markets sacrosanct. The idea that families are being crushed by market forces never seems to occur to them. They refuse to consider it. Questioning markets feels like apostasy. Both sides in this miss the obvious point. Culture and, and economics are inseparably intertwined. Certain economic systems allow families to thrive. Thriving families make market economies possible. You cannot separate the two. It used to be possible to deny this, but it's not anymore. The evidence is now overwhelming. How do we know? Consider the inner cities. 30 years ago, conservatives looked at Detroit and Newark and many other places, and they were horrified by what they saw. Conventional families had all but disappeared in poor neighborhoods. The majority of children were born out of wedlock. Single mothers were the rule. Crime and drugs and disorder became universal. What caused this nightmare? Well, liberals didn't even want to acknowledge the question. They were benefiting from the disaster in the form of reliable votes. Conservatives, though, had an explanation for inner city dysfunction, and it made sense. Big government. Decades of badly designed social programs had driven fathers from the home and created what conservatives called a culture of poverty that trapped people in generational decline. Well, there was truth in this, but it wasn't the whole story. How do we know? Well, because virtually the same thing has happened decades later to an entirely different population. In many ways, rural America now looks a lot like Detroit. This is striking because rural Americans wouldn't seem to have very much in common with anyone from the inner city. The groups have different cultures, different traditions, different political beliefs. Usually they have different skin colors. Rural people are white conservatives, mostly. Yet the pathologies of modern rural America are familiar to anyone who visited downtown Baltimore in the 1980s. Stunning out of wedlock birth rates, high male unemployment, a terrifying drug epidemic. Two different worlds, similar outcomes. How did this happen? Well, you'd think our ruling class would be deeply interested in knowing the answer, but mostly they're not. They don't have to be interested. It's easier to import foreign labor to take the place of native-born Americans who are slipping behind. 
But Republicans now represent rural voters. They ought to be interested. And here's a big part of the answer. Male wages declined. Manufacturing, a male-dominated industry, all but disappeared over the course of a generation. All that remained in many places were the schools and the hospitals, and both of them are traditional employers of women. In many areas, women suddenly made more than men. Now, before you applaud that as a victory for feminism, consider some of the effects. Study after study has shown that when men make less than women, women generally don't want to marry them. Now, maybe they should want to marry them, but they don't. Over big populations, this causes a drop in marriage, a spike in out-of-woodlock births, and all the familiar disasters that inevitably follow. More drug and alcohol abuse, higher incarceration rates, fewer families formed in the next generation. This is not speculation. It's not propaganda from the evangelicals. It's social science. We know it's true. Rich people know it best of all. That's why they get married before they have kids. That model works. But increasingly, marriage is a luxury only the affluent in America can afford. And yet, and here's the bewildering and infuriating part, those very same affluent married people, the ones who make virtually all the decisions in our society, are doing pretty much nothing to help the people below them get and stay married. Rich people are happy to fight malaria in Congo, but working to raise men's wages in Dayton or Detroit, that's crazy. This is negligence on a massive scale. Both parties ignore the crisis in marriage. Our mindless cultural leaders act like it's still 1961. And the biggest problem American families face is that sexism is preventing millions of housewives from becoming investment bankers or Facebook executives. For our ruling class, more investment banking is almost always the answer. They teach us it's more virtuous to devote your life to some soulless corporation than it is to raise your own kids. Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook wrote an entire book about this. Sandberg explained that our first duty is to shareholders above our own children. No surprise there. Sandberg herself is one of America's biggest shareholders. Propaganda like this has made her rich. What's remarkable is how the rest of us responded to it. We didn't question why Sandberg was saying this. We didn't laugh in her face at the pure absurdity of it. Our corporate media celebrated Sheryl Sandberg as the leader of a liberation movement. Her book became a bestseller, Lean In, as if putting a corporation first is empowerment. It is not. It is bondage. And Republicans should say so. They should also speak out against the ugliest parts of our financial system. Not all commerce is good. Why is it defensible to loan people money they can't possibly repay or charge them interest that impoverishes them? Payday loan outlets in poor neighborhoods collect 400% annual interest. Are we okay with that? We should not be. Libertarians tell us that's how markets work, consenting adults making voluntary decisions about how to live their lives. Okay, but it's also disgusting. If you care about America, you ought to oppose the exploitation of Americans, whether it's happening in the inner city or on Wall Street. And by the way, if you really loved your fellow Americans, as our leaders should, it would break your heart to see them high all the time which they are, a huge number of our kids, especially our boys, are smoking weed constantly. You may not realize that because new technology has made it all but odorless, but it's everywhere. All right, and that's we'll, stop not it. we'll stop it there. Because then he goes on some like anti-weed tirade about uh, how if you've ever looked at a 19-year-old that's high all the time, they're just in their own little world. True, though. And he kind of talks about uh, how, you know, he believes that weed is being used as a system of control, which, you know, I mean, that might very possibly that could be something to that. Um, so, like I said, this was something that you sent me, and we've actually watched it before, talked and, a lot about and, it, and we've talked a lot about it. So, um, I want to know your takeaways on this. Well, well, what, where he's getting at, what it is that... I think what it boils down to is that, um, I mean, you don't have to believe it, but it's believed by a lot of people that the left has kind of abandoned a lot of these economic issues and maybe not really abandoned as much as people feel that it's being eclipsed by the like social justice stuff and the Me Too movement and things like that. Um, you know, you don't have to subscribe to that, but that's kind of a general consensus that plays into the whole kind of Michael Moore narrative of why this, like all this, you know, old blue Rust Belt was able to give Trump the election, et cetera. 
And so it's it's really about I see a space that's being opened up for social conservatives to actually finally, uh, uh, you know, kind of divorce themselves from the the free market libertarians. Uh -huh. That's kind of, you know, I think that there's going to be a lot of future in that. And maybe it'll be a place of, uh, there can be some consensus between the aisles even, you know, maybe that's the only thing that, uh, that will allow that. But it's very interesting because like, like he was saying, I mean, it's, it seems like it, like the free market is, is almost held to a, you know, above religion. And, uh, that gets into like what Dr. Future talks about the social gospel of Christ versus, you know, the politicized, uh, American evangelicals and, all that kind of stuff, but it seems like there is a wedge opening up, and you know Trump is a symptom of that also. Um, so it's it's interesting. Well, Trump was a symptom of that frustration, and yeah. to kind of address your point about Michael Moore, I mean Michael Moore, I remember before a few days before the election, he was saying don't count Trump out because you know him being from Michigan. He felt the polls, yeah. Yeah, he felt the, like, you know, the, this, those states could go either way at that point. And at that point, they were they were firmly saying, well, they'll just take it for granted that it's going to be Hillary Clinton. Well, that was the big upset. And, of course, what do you have in states like Michigan and Wisconsin? You've got this kind of decaying urban, decaying industrial, and these, these workers that are frustrated and um, kind of like this almost a decay of – kind of like the the family and the values and all this kind of stuff um i think what it, where it comes down to though is really looking at how i guess you could say the liberals or the democrats or whatever have kind of lost this sense of fighting for the little person or looking and so they're looking at yeah, they're not looking at class as being the real struggle, which is really interesting when you think about it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's why you got what, you know, they call it corporate Democrats. Now. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, we're recording this on February 19th. Yes. That was uh, today, Bernie Sanders declared his candidacy. Yeah, he just threw it in, man. And I'm not going to play that, but a lot of what Bernie Sanders said today yes, yes. in his announcement was almost echoed by what Tucker Carlson said in this commentary almost two months ago. Yeah, they're smart. Yeah, so I find it interesting that that, that, that was echoed there. Um, so... Oh yeah, we were we were saying that Bernie threw his uh, his lot in today. Yeah, which was I thought was really interesting was his whole uh, comments on robotics and artificial intelligence sh should be uh, to benefit workers and not the greedy corporations. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's really got his finger on the pulse. It seems like. And see, we've been talking about that too. We've been talking about the whole like how automation is going to affect people if they're it. There is a doc great documentary out there that HBO put out called that uh, like Attack of the Killer Robots and it's actually all about how automation is kind of changing the industrial landscape right and how it's putting people out of work and see like this is kind of becoming like the elephant in the room nobody really wants to address that well, and saying that people are going that, that you might be in replacing humans with robots i mean it sounds crazy it sounds like an alex jones type of stuff that he talks about yeah but it's almost like it is going it, it almost seems like this is something where it's going to happen like people are going to be replaced and what is that going to cause what kind of social unrest is that going to cause what kind of chaos where is all that going to go and that's why there's even you know serious talk of uh people who wouldn't normally have talked about things like uh universal basic income and even stuff like that is on you know being presented as a serious idea for contingencies yeah What's the universal basic income thing? Because I'm hearing more and more about this, but I haven't really taken the time to really look into it myself. 
Oh, this is the idea that everyone should be given a amount of money just to circulate back into the economy and to keep them, yeah, to keep them, uh, you know, above water, and that that money will just circulate back in. And I guess it's like a you know kind of perversion of Keynesian economics, but uh, it was just kind of a real fringe idea. But it's like encroaching more and more mainstream. It seems like. I was, and I just put together. I was thinking that. You know, of course, there's been a lot of discussion that automation is actually taking more jobs than immigration and outsourcing. So maybe Bernie is like focusing. He's trying to focus some attention on automation because uh, he's he doesn't want that anti-immigrant sentiment. You know, he doesn't want to kindle that. He's trying to. You know, well, that's where kind of like th- th- that's kind of like where this is going is almost what it how it kind of feels. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, uh, queuing up the next video, sitting a little quieter. But uh, I've got one, an, another one I want to play. And this is kind of in... I feel like these two videos were very much in a corollary with each other. Um, they echoed each other. And what's interesting is you have this guy, Tucker Carlson, who's been seen as this very conservative com- commentator uh, with this silly bow tie. And then you have this other guy that uh, Serfiel's kind of inter- reintroduced me to uh, named Slovaj Zizak. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Tell everybody who he is. Um, well, I'm sure most people are probably familiar with him. He's, he's a... Uh philosopher from um slovenia yeah um where melania is from too oh yeah. yeah probably considered one of the uh one of the most relevant communist theorists in the world yeah. uh, probably certainly the most popular um so he's pretty un- unapologetically uh marxist hegelian would you say he's kind of like neo-marxist is that kind of is you would kind uh, of describe him not really. Probably the I mean, only real kind of Marxist philosopher in the world today. Well, no, he's just the he's the celebrity one. He's the only celebrity. I got gotcha. you. Know? Okay. Um, but he's uh, he's really into psychology, also Lacan, and um, he he has a lot of interesting ways of looking at the world. And uh, he's been a big cri- critic of the current left's what he sees as a session with political correctness. So he's always attacking that in his kind of uh, crass Eastern European way, which a lot of people like. Um, and then he, you know, makes a lot of enemies on the left also because he, he doesn't seem to be as... A, Yet he would probably be to the left of most of the people in the left Yes, but he here actually in makes, the United States. He makes a distinction that he's more of a... Uh, he's more of a traditional moralist. He doesn't say he's like some kind of family values guy, but he he doesn't see himself as like a hedonist, and and he points out that uh, that's not necessarily that hedonism and a destruction of quote unquote family values isn't necessarily a socialist or communist thing. Uh, he rejects the whole idea of there being this conspiracy of cultural Marxism. Um, and Which he gets on to Jordan Peterson a lot about. He yeah. talks about that. You'll hear that in this clip and what to play. And he, um, he sees that capitalism itself has been extremely radical in disrupting traditional ways of life and found the family unit, religion, et cetera. Because like, that's the thing is that, you know, if you're a traditional communist, you are supposed to actually appreciate the revolutionary potential of capitalism because capitalism is supposed to lay the groundwork for the next communist society. So he's actually sure. a traditional Marxist yeah. who appreciates the, that capitalism is actually radically transforming people's lives. Um, so that's really interesting. That's something I've always thought about too is is how there's this disconnect and so now you're seeing people like tucker carlson um point out that the traditional family units are uh enabled or helped by certain uh, economic conditions which is kind of like a marxist way of looking at things where the economics actually are preceding the social which is kind of a uh 
it, you know, it's totally opposite of, of usual conservative thinking. So that's where we're, these guys are kind of meeting almost. Yeah, it's almost like they're meeting in the middle. Now, Zizak can be kind of uh, difficult to listen to sometimes because he has a very heavy accent and he has this weird kind of tick uh, yeah. that he does where he... <laughs> He scratches his nose and snorts a lot, and it kind of looks like people have, have accused him of being constantly on cocaine. But I believe that's like he's that's just he him, has yeah. some kind of tur- Tourette's syndrome. Oh, okay. So, I didn't know that I thought it was just weird. Uh, I th- somebody said that in the comments. I don't know if that's exactly true. I haven't seen, but it it, it almost seems like that he's he's got some kind of OCD or some kind of weird kind of tick. Um, but I, I will fully in full disclosure. This was put out by RT, which, as YouTube likes to tell me, is funded in whole or part by the Russian government. You don't and, say. And gives me the Wikipedia article to prove it. So uh, let's listen to this. And we'll I, you know, of... I was trying to find out the you know the secrets of uh, some esoteric and, and secret societies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I was watching those videos on YouTube, I'm just so glad that they gave me that Wikipedia article so I could really <laughs> find the secrets of the Illuminati. <laughs> I finally did. It was right there, you know. I'm fine. I'm glad they gave me the authority, and to uh, they let me know what Freemasonry is really about and everything I've et- would ever need to know or have a question about. So I'm glad. Well, know. this is a whole other thing. I mean, this is a whole other issue. I mean, we've uh, we 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 were talking about this as being kind of like a nanny state kind of thing, but again, You're a private company, a private company, corporation. It's, it's kind of, um, I got into a debate with somebody that's more of a libertarian bent as I am. And they told me that these companies can do that because it's a private company. They can do what they want to do. But I said, but I said there, but they're also a public service almost because the public uses them for information. They're becoming commons of information. And so, um, you know, yes, of course. I never thought I'd have these arguments with people as far left as I am who are being so libertarian about this, <laughs> you know, like I never, yeah. I never thought I'd be having these conversations, but, but we are, I mean, something, you know, I mean, we're at least just talking about it. I'm, I'm not proposing some kind of legislation, fair use doctrine crap to put on, you know, I'm definitely not for that, but it's a conversation we need to have that these private companies are becoming our communicative commons, you know? Let me say something too. With this next video, this next one may be a little controversial. What I'm going to play because in this, Zizak is going to go after the Me Too movement, right? And he's going after the Me Too movement. But there's also a wider discussion about political correctness, like Serfiel just described about you know Zizak's ideas about the political correctness and that whole thing. So uh, we are not necessarily against me too um not at all essentially but i think that he has some valid points here and i'm gonna i'm gonna play this now there's some music and stuff involved but i'll kind of we'll try to just get past that although we should in principle support me too movement it is a tremendous event the basic model of relations between sexes which was maybe established even before class society emerged, already in tribal society, this predominant role of men and so on and so on. This is disappearing gradually today. Something radically new is emerging. But especially for this reason, we should be very careful and also critical upon me too. You know what is so important? Some black women who started me too 10 years ago already, they even proposed the term, they now raised their critical voice and claim Me Too is no longer what it was. It was meant not as a voice of Rose McGowan and other Hollywood stars who, whose career didn't work well and then they're protesting now. No, it was really a mass movement of women, first even black women, 
to protest there and to bring out in a public space the misery of their daily existence, daily exploitation and so on and so on. When Me Too exploded, it was reappropriated by the upper middle classes. It was one of the most important nights of the Me Too movement. Hollywood's biggest stars wearing black at the Golden Globes. And all this class dimension in the sense of Black, exploited blacks, working class women, and so on, and the massivity of the phenomenon, all this disappeared. So when people like Jordan Peterson dismiss Me Too as what they call cultural Marxism, I say, no, it's exactly the opposite. The problem with Me Too is not, as some people think, that it's too radical, you know, like it's, uh, uh, they will go too much to the end, everything is prohibited. Anything unwanted is harassment. Well, how the hell is the person who's making the offer supposed to distinguish, determine that beforehand? No, this excessive nature, you say one wrong word, you are immediately excluded and so on, is a mask of the fact that Me Too, the way it predominates today, it doesn't touch the real social problems poverty, daily exploitation, and so on and so on. And that's, for me, generally the problem with, uh, with political correctness. It deals with polite forms of talking, acting, and so on and so on. It doesn't approach the true economic roots of this, of this crisis. Also, you know where you can see the problem, not only with Me Too, but with this politically correct obsession with racism, sexism, and so on. Let's be frank. Although they speak about tolerance, what they really betray is fear of the neighbor. Listen, to have a neighbor, and I don't mean just an Arab, Jewish, black neighbor, but even any fellow man close to you, there is something very violent in over proximity. And I think that the implicit view of men in political correctness is like what Jean-Paul Sartre said, l'enfer c'est les autres, hell is others. The idea is how to keep the other at the distance. Whatever you do, you smoke, you you make a flirt in the remark, whatever, it's experienced as an aggression. So the whole logic of it, of excessive me too, of political correctness, is very narcissistic, individualistic. I want my peace, let the other remain at a distance. And what he says there at the very end of that clip where he talks about the narcissistic and the individualistic is very much as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that's kind of inimical to Marxism as a communal idea. Is that kind of where he's going with that? Yeah. Um, I think um, he's basically on the opposite end of what Tucker Carlson was saying, was saying the same thing. So he's saying that the left wants to be able to basically B class enemies of people to actually oppress them, which is mostly done through economics while because they're politically correct, uh, being good people and pat themselves on the back. And yeah. I guess that's like a summary that I would say he's, that's really kind of what he's, what he's going for. He can, he can be a little heady. You know, because he's so right because steeped in ideology, but Jordan Peterson is going to see it as like a well, it's cultural Marxism, and you're throwing around a word, you're throwing around a term. But Zizak would say, no, it's the exact opposite of Marxism. It's not. That's not what it is. I mean, you're you're not even remotely dealing with this idea of class. You're dealing with some with something else, where it's just policing of language or policing of each other. Yeah. yeah, and he would say it's just kind of what I've heard him talk about recently. We really articulate also is that uh, some of it is he says it's it comes across as and he's a he's an outsider. He's not even a North American, so right. I think he can 
see things, uh, you know, from a from an outsider's perspective. And he says that he thinks that the lower classes feel uh, the attack on on them from political correctness of being just really uh, loaded with class, you know, being essentially a class issue, being like, we don't associate with people who are, um, you can't say poor, but you can say who are uh, politically incorrect or or who are, you you call bigots or whatever, mm, okay. you know. So okay. he thinks it's a, uh, it's a mask of classism. It's also... Uh an intra-class thing in that they're just kind of policing each other within the same class. Right. Yeah. I can see that too, but he, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And, um, he's had a lot of criticism. Um, he, uh, you know, he's definitely not advocating being a terrible person or being, no, he's not being sexist, racist, homophobic, being against trans people, et cetera. But uh, the way that it's being used by the capitalist uh, liberal elites, he he thinks is counterproductive to actually addressing bigger issues and helping people to helping gain power. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he talks about this uh, being uh, ten years ago, kind of like this hashtag came about of um, of Me Too. And at the time, it was more kind of a grassroots thing from these few black women. They're talking about, you know, our lives and what we're kind of struggling with and what we're dealing with. And they actually quote this, uh, you know, you know, this is all Russian propaganda, so take of it as you will. Right, right. But the, they uh, quote this lady, one of the ladies that actually started it way back when, and she says, this is nothing like what I had in mind. And I think also, too, you know, looking at it as being where... This has kind of become a, because of um, Harvey Weinstein. That it was marginal now. until these rich white women came out with it. Exactly. Exactly. And now it's all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a, in our society, it's kind of becomes that it, only when someone that has so many followers on Twitter, which are a lot of rich, famous people are going to have, then is something going to become, to come to the forefront. Right. You know, I mean, it's kind of like where, where, where we are in our little niche here in, in, in podcasting is, you know, what we, we've been doing this for seven something years. Well, some famous person could come up and start their own podcast with episode one and get thousands, millions of downloads. And they do. I mean that, and they do. (laughs) And that's, that's kind of just how it goes. And that's, and I think what he may be saying in this is that you know you you almost can't escape this kind of capitalist system it's just you it's Im- almost impossible to escape it right right and that goes back to what you were saying about his kind of where he kind of he respects it as a marxist but what do you mean he respects well you saying that he respects the capitalism and what what it means as a, as a, as the stepping stone to, to yeah, or, or just he appreciates the disruptive character of it. I mean, because that's something that Marx really studied. You know, was I mean, it was that was industrial times. I mean, it was literally yeah. destroying the fabric of agrarian society. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so who knows if out of these, uh, I think our current you know political deadlock might be broken up by some other things like this. And, um, I think what he's, what they're both pointing at is that I think there actually is a possibility for a socially, uh, socially liberal, economically conservative urban elite versus a socially conservative, economically progressive or some kind of neo-agrarian America. And that might be, you know, 20 years, what our main divide is and then how automation and robotics and all the transhumanism shit plays into that. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Like, mm-hmm. I, I really think these, th- it, this stuff could go in other ways. You know, we can't just take for granted that there's going to be this deadlock when other things come into, you know, and, and, and I think the socially conservative, uh, worldview is going to be even more challenged by things that are going to come out of technology than some of the social things we have now. 
So, you know, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would I would tend to agree. I mean it, it's 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 going to be an interesting future as all this comes up. Um what exactly is what exactly is going to happen. I mean, are we it's almost like we're totally at the whim of all these corporations and you you really seeing the people becoming really dissatisfied with our economy with where where it's going and nobody can quite pinpoint exactly where it's heading so it's, it, it it it's interesting to me to see that you know somebody like as far disparate as Tucker Carlson and Savage Zizak that they are pretty much in agreement. You got somebody that is a very much you know very conservative and then someone that is a Marxist. Yeah. <laughs> so are we are we you know are we kind of the, the other question would be are we leaving these old paradigms of Marxism or capitalism versus Marxism, communism, whatever, are we leaving these old paradigms behind and those going to be replaced by completely new ones? I think they can be. They'll have elements of it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it'll... Why not? The thing is, you just... I mean, especially I would say the the right-wing conservatives of America are, are really good at playing semantic games... They know how to change the meaning of words, how to use words to scare people. Um, and, you know, basically what Tucker Carlson was saying, too, later on is like, oh, you may call me a socialist, but this isn't socialism. If we don't do something about this now, we're going to have socialism. And it's almost like a FDR saving capitalism type of scenario. Yeah, uh, that's but, another point of that, too. But, you yeah. know, all you got to do is call it something else. And totally, you know, usually right wing social conservatives could could support what would have been really left-wing economic policies they just won't call it socialism right you know i mean and call it social in socialism in name but not in name right. essentially yeah yeah so i mean and it's a libertarian because that's a dirty word right and this yeah. and this is a i think this is funny too because there's always been that that um uh, socially uh socially libertarian and economically libertarian minority in the Republicans. And this is like their worst nightmare. I mean, social conservatism with progressive economics. I mean, they, that's, that's their worst nightmare, man. So then what are they going to do? You know? Yeah. Well, we may be seeing a complete political realignment. I mean, it, it, it may be that the 2016 election and Trump, and everything that has happened, you may, you, you, when the dust clears, and I think 2020 will be extremely contentious. I mean, we're already, we're already starting to see it now in the first two months of 2019, yeah. just how contentious it's going to be. Um, I, and this whole, uh, the, especially this whole debate about the wall and the budget, the, the, the government shutdown and all this. I mean, are, is the Republican Party going to necessarily survive? Are the Democrats going to necessarily survive? Are we going to see a complete realignment of parties? And it, it could happen. And it may be that it's historically that it's overdue to happen. Yes. So when you've got these ideas and these thoughts that are... Uh, percolating around like what Tucker Carlson is saying, you know, I mean, you are emphasize where you are emphasizing class, which is something that a conservative has never done essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty radical. Well, they see, I mean, if you're going to leave that chip out there, I mean, they're going to grab it, dude. That's, that's probably why Trump won. I mean, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, and I'm sure we'll get criticism for this, but uh, it's like, uh, you know, to, uh, I don't know how else, what I was going to say. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thought lost. <laughs> but all this is, you know, all this is really speculative and we're having fun and this is why we're not political pundits. Um, and in the, well, in the critique you know, like I said before, I don't want people to think we're saying that 
what are t- termed the social justice issues like don't matter. But uh, I think if you want to win, then leading with economics is everyone sees that's the way. So the social conservatives, yeah. they got their social yeah. agenda, but they know to lead with economics. And even if it's uh, because because for the for the Democrats, um, sorry guys, identity politics did not work. It didn't win. You know, it, it, yeah, it didn't work. It didn't win. And you know, I mean, you can you can go out there and you, I mean, you, I think on a on a personal level, you can go out there and be try to do fight for social justice. I mean, that's where you probably should fight for it. But from from like that standpoint like people are it's it's just still the economy it's still people's pocketbooks it's still the bottom line and it's also still the fact that you know we're gonna have people that are like what tucker carlson is saying you know you're gonna have you're having classes of people now that are dispossessed yeah yeah and another thing i wanted to kind of address on that was you know you talk about the inner cities and all that and this is another thing that i've I've I tend to agree with is that people are have been very critical. Some people have been very critical about the whole um, opiates epidemic and what is going on and why it's now that's a national health crisis as it should be. Right. But back in the eighties, you know, when crack was just devastating black neighborhoods, nobody cared. Yep. You know, nobody gave a shit. And you know, once it starts happening to white people. So then you got, you know, you've got the whole race issue involved in that as well. So, you know, is it to where it just has to happen to Ma and Pa and Apple Pie for people to really sit up and take notice? Yeah, of course. Because that's one thing we've talked about, too, is where a lot of the social, the a lot of these conservatives that have talked about, you know, Waco and Ruby Ridge and all these things... You know, um, where were they when Move was firebombed in, was it Move? Yeah. Yeah, when Move was firebombed in Philadelphia, which was essentially the same as what happened in Waco. Right. And where were they then, you know, because it happened to black people? Well, if it's going to happen to them, it's going to be turned on you eventually. Oh, yeah. And, you know, now people are seeing you know, like, yeah, all those same tactics, all those same things have been turned now on white people. And now well, all deindustrialization, sudden, takes yeah, deindustrialization and drugs have been a rural problem. I mean, these things have been going on. But I think with the opiate epidemic is it's actually killing enough people that now it's like, oh, shit, you know. Yeah. Because all the, you know, those things have been happening, but this many people just dying. It's. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I've got friends that struggle with it man yeah we all do you know it's, it's hard not to yeah you know people now you know i mean you somebody gets put on the somebody gets put on these painkillers because they gotta do all these surgeries and then all of a sudden you know they get they get taken off of that and all of a sudden they're all their only recourse is heroin and they get hooked on that and now heroin is laced with fentanyl and that's killing people left and right Yep. And yeah. So I guess the robots are just going to take over. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) What are they going to do? Yeah. Get them on that robo dope. Any thoughts on what's going on in uh, Venezuela right now? Um, About this whole thing. I wish I knew more about it, but from... From what I understand, just stateside here, we've got some uh, some pretty old elements from uh, back in the Cold War, Latin American days, who are still around, and they are, uh, I think they're getting pretty thirsty and uh, thinking they can have a little little venturism there, and that uh, that concerns me. It's pretty scary. Some pretty scary folks. Um, John Bolton be one of them. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, I mean, it'll probably all be f- through proxy, but just we could see some really terrible things happen to people, you know, because a lot of these guys are still around and the guys that are around down there were the people they're influenced by their heroes from the previous generation. 
you know, we're talking about some real, uh, real heavy duty, uh, right wing extremists who don't have problems with, uh, murdering thousands of people. Yeah. It could get ugly really quick. And the Russians are on their side too. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So, So, I mean, in a sense, I mean, you really can say that, uh, what is his name? Maduro, the, the president down there. Yeah. How he's, I mean, how he has been able to keep hold on power. He must be doing it by just total dictatorial means because uh, that country has pretty much essentially fallen apart. I don't understand as much, but I mean, there is, he has, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the figures are, but there, there is popular support. I mean, yeah. You know, well, it's a it's, divided country. I don't mean it's the entire country, but there's enough popular support and they have their narrative, you know, just like the, what, what, uh, what I did, I really, I was listening to project censored. Have you ever heard that? That's like a weekly show. They were actually playing it on radio free Nashville here and they were talking about it, but they were the, the big focus was that the both sides of the American establishment media are totally for the coup anti Maduro. And they were talking about how that's strange, how just all across the board, corporate media in America, liberal or conservative is pushing the same, uh, foreign policy line, which I think we're seeing a lot of other stuff too, which is, that's interesting and pretty scary that no one is given the other side or, you know, they have their own narrative. I don't, I don't know enough about Venezuela, but you know, they have their own narrative that it's, uh, you know, that, that essentially their project has been sabotaged. And then the conservative narrative is that, oh, this is what happens when uh, the state owns the oil and, and right. tries to redistribute right. wealth. So, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about it, and I'm not ideological enough on either side to really, like, you know. And uh, Venezuela is the main country that's being used right now to say, like, well, if you like Bernie Sanders, yes, that's what yeah. – uh, do you want it to be like Venezuela? Do you want do you want that to happen? Uh, yeah. Uh, that's, the, the, that's the one country everybody is everybody has used as an example. Yeah, and, and you know, America is not Venezuela. <laughs> you know, sorry. But, uh, right. Right. I, I, but, you know, I mean, the the way uh, I think people can, I think people can get where we come from. I mean, like I've always, I've always been up front that if, you know, I'm more left than, of center than anything, but I'm a, I, I, I get really nervous when I feel like people are trying to pigeonhole me or think they can take me for granted. And I try to be as open-minded as I can. So, you know. Mm-hmm. Very true. Let's hit some other interesting topics that are not so political. All right. This here and all of is brought to you by our new sponsors. Interdimensional alien AI overlords from the future. Please show your support by going to patreon.com slash conspiranormal or making a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com Please show your support by going to patreon.com slash conspiranormal or making a one-time donation at conspiranormal.com And now, back to the show. <laughs> All right, had a little break there. <laughs> yeah, it was starting to sound like a uh, last podcast on the left or something like that. So, okay, more, I guess you could call it paranormal or synchro mystical what are we talking about whatever you want to talk about um um yeah are we talking about uh the rebirth of pan 
Well, yeah, I've uh, I've finally I've been trying to read Weird America and Rebirth Pan for probably almost twenty years, and I finally went through Inner Library Loan to get a copy because uh, both these are like going for five hundred bucks plus mm -hmm. online. Um, so I got them and re and uh, they're really interesting. Uh, Weird America, you know, is kind of just like this uh, state by state breakdown. A few you know strange fourteen. Uh, strange phenomenon uh, or hauntings, you know, in, in different states. But uh, Rebirth of Pan, I guess I really didn't understand the scope of it. And uh, it's kind of, let's see, it came out in, in 1983. And it's kind of uh, this grand theory of all this Fortiana and uh, archaeological speculation and uh bigfoot all the you know all that kind of stuff to uh entities under and he's kind of got this big theory that these are all manifestations of the earth spirit whatever that is uh even like the he thinks the mounds of the mississippian culture were uh kind of just like just came up out of the ground like a crop circle or something yeah. so yeah. It's pretty far out. I didn't know it was that far out, uh, but I've been reading it, and uh, it's really interesting, but I have to say uh, the uh, absolute discounting of all the, the Native American stuff is just kind of kind of overboard even for people into speculative archaeology. I mean, he's pretty dismissive of any Native Americans being able to even come up with uh, astronomical systems or build certain sites or I, I don't I don't know I, it's it's just a little overboard even for things that are already problematic you know um and he just spends a lot of time uh, kind of praising these antiquarianism uh, antiquarians you know uh -huh. which was like yeah. pre-archaeology mostly dominated by like adventurers or people trying to make money um and there are all kinds of sites I mean the you know the uh, Mormonism came out of that ilk, you know, and so it's something I'm totally familiar with. And uh, but I had to go back and kind of learn about what the what the conditions of the of the time were, and uh, it's a uh, it, it's interesting. But that really bothered me about it. But uh, he, he's he's got a lot of interesting things to say about other stuff. Uh, he kind of confirms the. Um, the uh, uh, Masonic interests in the mound culture and uh, a lot of other things. It's, it's really, it's good, but uh, I was kind of taken aback by, you know, some of the just like total discounting of Native American abilities is, you know. <laughs> yeah, so he, he talks about uh, in one of the pictures, you sent me a couple of pictures that you took from the book and one of them is like the heading is Indians are dubious choice as early stargazers. Yeah. I mean, why? I mean, why Why would you even... Well, like, and I, these are I, old... Is that uh, because you're just completely discounting that those well, I don't know. are I, obviously too primitive or something? I haven't or? seen... I, ha I hadn't seen an actual uh, yeah. Indian account in the entire book. I guess he never talked to a Native American. But, it's uh, a little bit problematic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um... You know, I, I understand why this book was so was so popular, just because it's such a compilation of so much Fortiana and uh, speculative archaeology. Um, but he talks about this guy John Haywood, who is like Tennessee's official historian. Mm -hmm. So I just go and find the guy's book, you know, and he's like praising Haywood that you know. And apparently, Andrew Jackson really liked Haywood and we, we kind of talked about that last year Rob and I did um, a little bit of like the the Salutrian hypothesis right. and how um, right that was that that so that uh, Jackson was a proponent of that and I guess through Haywood that that oh, was yeah. where he was coming from yeah and this is you know just pre and during you know Mormonism came out of all that you can see where it could come out of all that um, but uh I went back and like try to read a lot of Haywood's book and uh, you know, it's, it's just really primitive understanding of 
world history and different cultures around the world, which for the time that's understandable, but yeah, you know, he's like trying to, uh, most of it is he's trying to prove, um, that the, uh, you know, the, the Mississippian culture here was a result of uh, some kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, Hindu or Mexican origin, so mm-hmm. Aztec or uh, Hindu, and, and um, you know, it's like, it's it's interesting to read all these different accounts, and to, the the antiquarians are pretty interesting people, I mean, that's where all, the, they got all the Indiana Jones stuff out of, but, uh, you know, to a whole science had to be made and you know people have really been trying to correct a lot of the errors of the antiquarianism uh, antiquarians so you know you can't exactly like hold them up as some like <laughs> standard of like intellectually brave people you know i mean it's just total yeah, you, speculation from like 200 years ago man i mean you showed me this youtube i guess it's a youtube video that the mormons put out and they talked about how e- even the Mormons don't believe a lot of the hoaxes and stuff yeah, that yeah. people were fi- supposedly quote unquote finding in these Indian mounds. And- yeah. So in, in the book, he gets in all these different, uh, would have most have been, you know, uh, officially, uh, you know, called hoaxes. These strange artifacts have been found in mounds, et cetera. And even just looking at them, I mean, they look pretty hokey, but, to his credit, he doesn't think that people actually made him. He thinks that this, like, Earth spirit actually created these strange objects, too. Yeah, he's kind of got this weird Gaia hypothesis yeah, going on. that, that they're, like, the from Earth this kind of id or yeah. something. And uh, so, uh, you know, he's he's got these artifacts. And, of course, you know, Mormonism was built off of one of these uh, supposed, you know, artifacts that then, you know, I guess was taken back. So they, they had their way out you know that's how i look at it like because the angels came and took the tablets back or whatever like that was like you know they made it clear oh i didn't know that part i thought the i thought the 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 the, uh the tablets were somewhere still in the no i think i think they took it back okay they took it back yeah I i might be wrong i might be wrong i was you know and uh so but you know, so people were bringing this type of stuff to them because obviously you'd think it'd be up their alley if they could prove more of their kind of mythology of Eastern peoples or Europeans being in here and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, uh, but they rejected all these, like, so. I will say this um, about the antiquarian aspect of this. And I think this still goes on. Yes. Okay. And I actually have a personal story that kind of illustrates this. Now, I'm not going to say where we were or who we were dealing with, but uh, Rob and Luke and I went to a conference almost three years ago now. And we were at this conference in this undisclosed location. And there was a, in the little room that we were in, there was a gentleman. And we may have mentioned this, I'm not sure, but there was a gentleman that was selling these little figure, they looked like little figurines, and they almost looked kind of like what you're talking about, where they looked ancient, they looked old, okay? And he had his whole booth set up, nobody's really coming to talk to anybody, we were there doing our recordings and stuff like that, so we weren't really selling anything, except for the Georgia Guidestones documentary at that time. And... So he was there, and Luke, with his son, he had a teenage son, and Luke goes up, and he's looking at all the stuff that he has sitting on the table, and Luke comes back to me, and he says, yeah, I was looking at that, and there's this, I asked the guy where it came from, and he said, oh, I find, we live in Mexico, and I found this, we find this laying around in the ground, it's old stuff, like the natives, some, the natives left it there, and uh, all these carvings, and Luke looks at me and says, well, that's interesting, considering that I just saw something that is a character from a meme that I've seen on the, on Facebook. <laughs> hey, man, they had a meme too back then. Yeah. And keep in mind, you've got his son, who's probably about six, maybe 15, 16 years old, sitting there with him. And so, you know, I think that maybe the kid's on Facebook, he possibly saw this meme and maybe carved something. So 
our idea is okay this shit's obviously fake like what he's saying okay well there was a speaker at this conference i'm not gonna tell you who um that came there and bought a whole bunch of these things for like I want to say ten to twenty thousand dollars. All right, and he, the guy selling them, kind of promptly took off and packed up and left. And I guess he drove all the way back from undisclosed location back to Mexico. And I asked one of the organizers of the conference. I asked them who is the, what's the deal with that and he says well this guy comes every year he waits for this particular individual to come they talk they come up with a price he sells this particular individual these figurines and they leave and then they pack up and they leave hey yeah it's pretty good so movie. when you told me about the antiquarian stuff in the fakery immediately made me think of that what happened and i thought to myself okay maybe some people in this little paranormal and um ancient mysteries and all this kind of stuff maybe they're not such honest people no and uh that was the beginning of a big thought that was kind of like a big thought process process but this guy he paid thousands of dollars for this stuff yeah and uh, then i had to really kind of ask myself why was he paying for that was he did he either a he thought it was real right and he was fooled even though clearly there was you know this this me must have traveled back in time to the uh, to the aztecs or whatever and they carved this thing or b he wanted to get it he wanted to sell it for himself yeah. because he figured his clout would get him more yeah he put his name on it see he wanted to take it out of circulation no oh, that's a little too uh those are the three those are the three possibilities that i can think of i think c is a little yeah. little much so there was some so. tomfoolery and some skullduggery to borrow a phrase right and and which uh you know i mean and I was real excited to finally read this because Jim Brandon is known as the uh, uh, protege of James Shelby Downard. And, uh, right. You draw a line. And he's the one who made the initial recordings with Downard that were referenced in Cosmic Trigger by Robert Anton Wilson that are finally re-released here and everything. And, you know, I was really looking forward to reading it. And uh, it's very, it's very, got a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of interesting Bigfoot and, you know, stuff that... I'm sure yeah, Cutch and yeah. them are really going to yeah. dig. Yeah, it goes in. I think it, it, you sent me one of the pictures. It seems like a lot of people are, read, are finally getting to read this now. Yeah, it needs to come back in print. For some needs reason. To, like, Tim Beckley, if you're out there listening, you need to put this book back in print. Tim Beckley's the guy that does that. Um, but, it, it, yeah, you sent me a picture, and uh, when I saw it, I was like, that's the Chestnut Ridge. Yes. With all the weird, high strange stuff that happened on Chestnut Ridge. So he does go into that. Now, there was one part that I thought was pretty interesting from this. Uh, you actually sent me this. This is from the book. Microwave pollution certainly is one possibility for understanding, albeit a rather mechanistic one. However, in at least one case, we've seen that a mobile home was vacant when occupied by children after the drowning of a companion. It was psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich who first theorized that the mysterious life energy he called orgone might be, might be capable of accumulation in peculiarly constructed containers, which he called orgone boxes. This energy, Reich thought, somehow was connected with sexuality. Knowing as we do that many of the freakish episodes we've been examining occur to women during the menstrual phase, one wonders whether trailers might not be acting as some sort of energy accumulators, orgone or what you will, that are having an unrealized effect upon the pan force in the surrounding environment. You heard it, folks. Possibly even automobiles containing erotically inclined couples parked in lovers' lanes might be, strong up, might be storing up the same energies. 
If this were the case, it suggests that the power behind these manifestations may not be entirely under control, but is acting somewhat chaotically like a moth to a light. In response to this, whatever it is gathered in metal boxes in which increasing numbers of people travel and reside. On the other hand, if we are dealing with some form of intelligence, it may be that the power simply does not like to have people living in metal structures accumulating such forces. Or these structures may have a shielding effect that is excluding some unknown force of the environment from the inhabitants. And I like, I like, there's, you only left me like just that page, but at the, there's three sentences at the bottom. Somehow he goes, I don't know where he's going here. Alistair Crowley said his scientific Illuminati, the Ordo Templi Orientis, believed that the real secret of alchemy was a system of sexual magic carefully conceived from the, from the authorities. Yeah. You know all those metal heads in the trailer parks, man, getting out of <laughs> Alistair Crowley and Anton Levy. Um, but yes, so, I mean, yeah, that's so why... So apparently this, that's why weird shit happens in trailer parks. Trailers are orgone accumulators. Well, what's interesting, when you sent me that and it talked about the cars and the lover's lanes... Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Remember that that has come up on this show before yeah. where Nick Refren talked about it in one of the interviews we did with him about the paranormal parasites it's the echo not too long now. ago yeah. and then with christopher coleman talked about that independently about the lover's lane stuff and then brandon is talking about it here in so are 80- they just getting it from him well that's the thing i'm really realizing i mean that's what you know i kind of i kind of went in on this book and some of the things i disagree with but it's really it's got a lot of really interesting just wild things and it's just a compilation of so much uh, crazy Fortiana and stuff that, you know, it's a, it's a great book, uh, to have just for entertainment at least. But yeah, I'm seeing how influential this is. And there's all these, you know, other pieces and accounts of, of some of the ideas, but it seems like he's really influenced by Keel and, uh, and Coleman. Yeah. And, uh, because he was, you know, Coleman was a big researcher in Fortiana, uh, before, you know, he wrote this. I think those two guys read of, um, influence each other yeah really but, so you see with that with keel coleman and uh brandon here i mean this was like a big this was really a, a big route to a lot of and uh, ways of thinking that are becoming more popular just recently it seems like it's pretty it's pretty interesting so but uh, I'd, I'd like to talk to the guy one day you know i think it would be awesome to have him on the show yeah but he's uh i think he's a little old school i had to yeah I had to write to a P.O. box to get a copy of those serious rising tapes and, uh, you know. Right. So maybe right. we can write him a letter. Well, one time I would like, I think, that we should play a little bit of that and discuss it. We need to do a show just on that. Right. About the serious rise. And we're not obviously going to play the whole thing. But we'll, you know, maybe take some selected uh, parts from it and talk about, you know, you'll actually hear the voice of James Shelby Downard. So. Yeah. Which that's available. I mean, you can find yeah. it now. Yeah. I'm surprised I haven't seen it uh, more online. But uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm glad I finally got to read it. Uh, it's pretty interesting, you know. I'm I'm used to not agreeing with everything, or you know, I'm used to dealing with problematic texts. So you have know. you started in on Weird America? Yeah, I've I've just been bouncing around to the states that I'm you know I'm interested in and stuff like that. So that's just a real fun yeah. travel book. Oh. You got five hundred dollars. I think. <laughs> I think the rebirth of Pan, um, Josh, and and we probably will have confirmation on this by the time we actually post this. But I think Josh and Tim are going to probably use some of that. Oh yeah, it's without a doubt. Foot book. Yeah. yeah, you see those. You know where a lot of those roots are coming from. A lot of ideas. So it's uh, it's pretty essential. What for is that. the Pan energy that he talks about in the? He he talked about in that paragraph. What does he mean by that? I think it's some kind of Gaian thing. Okay. Um, but also like I think, a life force. Yeah, or like a intelligence, you know. But I think he also thinks there's elements to the actual Pan mythology of some kind of weird, maybe Tulpa-like thing with that. Also, because yeah. yeah. it's interacting with uh, the way that it's interacting with primarily you know europeans who are here now and so there's some of that which i think that's that's interesting uh to 
to think about too, as far as like, um, you know, I think that the Americas had an, an effect of, uh, making a lot of the Europeans kind of find this mysticism and paganism again, you know? So I think that's kind of some of what he's getting at too. Sure. And there's a lot more about the burial, about the Indian mounds, uh, there's a lot of stuff you've been researching. We we both been kind of looking into that. Yeah, a just lot. Uh, Nashville was absolutely covered, and now yep. really learning how much of a trade was in the uh, destruction of all this stuff uh, by the antiquarians. Um, you know, it's part of the reason why we have such a scarce uh, archaeological record. It seems like too probably. Who knows? Yep. Well, I think we'll leave it there. I think that was pretty good. Yeah, that was um, a good one. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, thank you guys for tuning in. I know this is a little unusual than we we what we usually do with Gus. We're going to try to do these more and try to do like maybe I'd like to do themes. Maybe we could have, you know, other people sit in on these as well um, instead of it just being like a guest oriented thing. Uh, so be looking for that. Um Serfiel, if you would tell everybody where we can find us and our you Patreon, all that good stuff. Yeah, uh, we really uh, need your help here in improving Studio B and uh, soon... We got to buy Rebirth of Pan for 500 bucks. Yeah, we need to purchase uh, Weird America and Rebirth of Pan. That's probably going to set us back at least $1,500. Uh, <laughs> no, guys, but... Yeah, go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal if you want to... Uh, Help us out monthly, if not monthly. If you just want to do a, uh, a, a one-time donation, you can go to conspiranormal.com. Yep. And sorry, hit us there. All right, excellent. All right, guys, um, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back uh, next week with another guest on Conspiranormal. Conspiranormal. Let's go get some chicken wings. Hell yeah.